Hello and welcome back to Season 3 of Sequelizers. This is the show all about fixing bad sequels to good movies. If there was a good movie that was followed by a terrible sequel, you better believe we're going to try and fix it. I am your host, Jack Chambers, and joining me are the two teams of titular sequelizers. The team of Tim Matum. Hello. And Matthew Stogden. Hey. And their opponents, Alec Plowman. Yes. And Stuart Ashen. Also, yes. This episode is all about fixing a sequel to a classic 80s horror movie. That's right. We're back with this season's obligatory horror film entry. It's Poltergeist 2, The Other Side, from 1986. Mm. Mm. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> mm. <clears throat> Collective zombie noises and just... <coughs> it's, it's funny because we've had a few sequels on this show where we, it's come up and we've been like, you know, it's not great, but it's not terrible. And then we have a few films... Highlander 2 last episode <laughs> Yay. where we just turn around and go that was utter dog shit yep. and this is one of them Yes, because yeah, absolutely this is. movie is awful because we need to talk about the original because in this room we had a discussion just before recording this session and also when we ended the last session where we said oh the Poltergeist and there's this thing around the room saying does anyone like Poltergeist and there was this sort of one not necessarily meek yeah. but one eh, from the room followed by a sort of not really and Alex saying oh it's alright <laughs> <laughs> I like I like Poltergeist quite a lot the first yeah, one yeah you see I'm uh mm. yeah I, 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 I don't mind Poltergeist oh Tim I, I've never I've never properly sat through the whole thing but the bits that I've seen I'm like oh this seems you know competent that is the structured. problem I think it's kind of somebody came up with cool ideas for scenes and then just kind of linked them together with some family stuff and it doesn't yeah. quite gel which is kind of the problem with Poltergeist too because it had a really famous trailer which is where yes. the we're back right. yep. thing comes which from and that's the genuinely most famous line iconic. Yeah. and a really iconic mm. kind of setup for the trailer and then the rest of what the 95 minutes or however long this thing is it's just absolute garbage that just ruins everything the first film set up in so many ways as we'll discuss in a moment and just oh terrible performances all around from the entire cast and crew the entire cast i know there is one strong there's one very very strong thing in this film i wonder if we're all thinking the same thing of course we are because there is only one very strong thing in this film it's not a good sequel and it's not a good film, but I do enjoy how buck wild it gets in like the last <laughs> 10 minutes <laughs> where it's like, oh yeah, we're just going to float through to a, uh, you know, a shadow dimension and then uh, Craig T. Nelson's going to throw a spear at a thing. Mm. Uh, and uh, thanks, Gran. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, Gran's an angel. Bizarre bullshit. I wish, I wish it had had that commitment to the entire film like i've just like Go off the fucking chain yeah 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 <laughs> so yeah we mentioned that the first one kind of splits the room but it was a huge critical and commercial success at the time in 1982 which is four years before the sequel and there's a whole controversy about the whole spielberg involvement and whether tobe was directing and there's this whole kind of thing it basically seems to be that spielberg was more involved than he's credited and he has actually directed the essentially directed the whole first yes, poltergeist. the story goes that apparently mr toby hooper was a bit off his face for most of it as well which didn't help so least that's what people on set have said <clears throat> yeah yeah don't sue me i think it was elder rubenstein that said like the six days that she shot Spielberg was there the whole time and she met Toby Hooper like twice. So like, hello, and he put the cameras in the corner and I was like, that'll do. It, it, it does feel like an Alex Garland on Dread kind of thing. Yes, where it does come yeah. until years later yeah. that actually that person helmed it, which in essence is why I think there are two elements about Poltergeist, the first one that irritate me. The first one is that Spielberg's heavy involvement, uh, not because he's heavily involved, but because he is heavily involved and this doesn't feel worthy enough it feels like a 20 interesting 11 steven spielberg effort <laughs> interestingly it's one of the few films that he's actually written so his involvement goes much much from deeper the, exactly than, from the yeah. start second thing i don't like is that to me the whole thing feels like an attempt to make a more palatable and presentable a mainstream release of the exorcist same premise sort of yeah. same yeah. general yeah. gist contained mean. within a house but something that would be much more um, marketable and actually sellable to people rather than just, oh, that's going to have to get banned. That kind my, of thing. my thing with Poltergeist and the way that you, I think you've got to look at it if you want to appreciate it is it's a, it's a ghost story and that's why I think it is more, that's why it is more palatable to, yeah. if you think about it from a horror purist perspective, I can see why people have 
issues with it. But sure. as a ghost story, I I find those things much more. I still think, as I say, I think it's I, fine at best. But then, um, again, we're talking about a generation who've seen things built upon it better. Yeah. They also get the contemporary audiences now because I know a lot of the audience members will think, oh, I'll go watch Poltergeist, Poltergeist 2 if they want to. But this is also the paranormal activity crowds who are going to be seeing that kind of poltergeisty kind of goings on and then go yeah. and go, huh. I think you've got to put it into context oh, for how yes. for what it was in 1982. I mean, I like I said, I I really enjoy it. I and I I still enjoy it, sort of in a contemporary context. But I I can see why people might not hold it up in the same regard. But I think it was incredibly influential. That's that's undeniable. Talk, yeah, talking about this as a as a sort of companion piece to um, The Exorcist, and you know, a, a attempt to make it more a little bit more family friendly. Um, it makes me wonder, uh, someone who can remember film dates better than I can, when did uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind come out? Uh, late 70s, like 77, 78, I think. Yeah. Seven, Close Encounters of 78, and yeah. Spielberg's director's cut gets re-released in 81. Yeah, yeah so yeah. that feels like there's connective tissue there as well. Mm-hmm. That it, It's, you know, obviously one is horror slash ghost story, the other is science fiction, but it's it's sort of dealing with similar territory i would be really interested to see what had happened had toby hooper actually directed it because with him having more of a horror background they it's an interesting one because they brought him on because of texas chainsaw that was their reason for bringing him in and i do wonder if he would have pushed it in a harder direction had it been more had he been more present because it is incredibly spielbergian Mm. in its i wonder i wonder what him trying a pg film looks like as well yeah. if, if he would yeah. have been capable of doing that <laughs> yeah maybe maybe the rating would have changed if he had kind of more creative control than than spielberg so in mean, a horror film does live and die by the sort of horror imagery in it so to speak and there is some fairly strong imagery in poltergeist which becomes yeah. semi-iconic isn't there you've got the little girl on the television you've got mm. the clown of course and the old kind of yeah, the tree, that kind of weird skeletal dog thing near the end. That's yeah. one of the weaker ones, perhaps. And even um, where the mother is being sort of pushed up the wall onto the ceiling by the mm. yes. guest. And yeah. even the kind of the ghostly apparition, sort of when it first appears, and the the, the lights yeah. flying around and stuff. It was quite a strong, it, very influential. Time, yeah. That one, yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's yeah, it's impressive from that sense. It's just that personally, I just don't think it holds together as a sort of coherent film. Yeah. Pacing wise, it's all off as well. Mm-hmm. Maybe. I know it's kind of intentionally doing that, and Nightmare on Elm Street did a similar thing where it, you know you start to think, oh, it's it's winding down now, it's winding up, to, building up to a big crescendo, and then, haha, charades you are. It's it, not. It does have that that somewhat tacked on ending. I know people talk about the clown scene mm. being iconic, but that's probably the one bit of the movie that I don't really. It doesn't like. really. Yeah, it's odd how it's become such a thing, and if you actually go and back and watch it, you're like, oh. It, yeah, it does. It does. You could have done better there, guys. Yeah. You know, you could have ended it at that moment and then just yeah. cut to the scene of them in the motel, and it still would have made perfect sense. Yeah, the yeah. last the last ten minutes don't need to be there. But on the whole, I think it. I think it is deserved of its reputation for being a sort of a, an important and influential film. Which is something that Poltergeist 2 most definitely is not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so before we go on to Poltergeist 2, has anyone seen the remake of Poltergeist? Yeah. Any good? No. No. Uh, it's I've got good people in I was going to say, you sound yeah, Rockwell, does, but, you know. <laughs> it's, it's like a lot of contemporary remakes and reboots whereby its heart's in the right place and it re- replicates things that it's seen but doesn't understand the soul of. And as much as I don't really care for Poltergeist, I appreciate what it did. And this just literally takes almost a visual scrapbook of things... Almost like the Snyder-esque way of adapting a comic, where he flips through a comic, sees his image, and goes, that's cool, I'll just sort of figure out how to make it work. <laughs> I don't know, he never quite gets that far. Yeah, never, yeah. yeah it never really hits the bottom of the head. I mean, again, this is the thing, the visuals do work. It's quite impressive. The problem is the CGI is nothing in place of those visual effects that we had in the original. The physical stuff, I mean, yeah, okay, you could argue that the Hulk on a horse... That's in the first one, isn't it? When all the little toys are yeah, yeah. rolling yeah, past the and there's like a lamp. One. And at one point, I'm pretty yeah, sure I yeah. saw a Hulk riding a horse. Um, I could have been... Yeah, there is a Hulk a riding a horse. Yeah. A Amigo Hulk riding a horse. Yeah. Uh. But it's, a, it's, an effect, it's an effect that, you know, it looks like quite shy. But it still looks better than I imagine most CGI effects will look in the same amount of time yeah. in the future. And there's a little piece of trivia that 
weirdly enough, Poltergeist 2 was nominated for an Academy Award for visual effects it as was. well. Was it Geiger? Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah. Ooh. It's, yeah. It, it's Giga's involvement and that whole kind of like, yeah, special effects side of things. Yeah, I, I was actually quite impressed with the, the weird... I believe oh, he's credited as something like vomit beast. V- vomit beast. Vomit that's beast, it. Yeah. Uh, the vomit beast that comes. I was. I was reasonably impressed. It's got a. You can see the Geiger, and it also feels very influenced by the thing. And yeah, it's. It, but it also doesn't feel like it belongs in that film. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great effect. It just uh, is in no way tonally in keeping with that film or what Poltergeist should be. Have any of you guys seen Giga's original concepts for some of the monsters for Poltergeist 2? I've seen enough dicks. The great life. beast and the, and the vomit monster and all that kind of stuff. They were presumably cocks. <laughs> Mostly cocks. Oddly, enough, they look quite like Junji Ito-esque for those manga fans really? out there. It's Ooh. kind of really Uzumaki and all twisted Ooh. and creepy. And Was it Giga couldn't go to America, so sent over one of his representatives and wasn't very happy with how his work had been represented on screen in the end? Which doesn't surprise me because he didn't strike me as the most agreeable yeah, it was, of blokes. It was, a, it, was a, it was a studio like middleman called Connie DeFries. And, wow. And basically, yeah, Giga was pissed off and really pissed off. So he drew a lot of pictures of him getting The shredded. lead sculptor, <laughs> Stuart Land, uh, basically just sounded off and said DeFries had no idea what he was doing. He was bad mouthing Giga the whole time. There, there's been interviews with him over the years of how much. Like the studio completely screwed it up, and like we had all these great ideas and these great designs, and me and my team of visual effects artists and sculptors were ready to build all this cool stuff because Giga, and then they were like, "Nah, let's scrap it and just do some other cheap shit because we have hardly any budget." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, to summarize and give you a little tease for the plot of Poltergeist Two. The Freeling family move in with Diane's mother in an effort to escape the trauma and aftermath of Caroline's abduction by the Beast in the first movie. But the Beast is not to be put off so easily and appears as a ghostly apparition as the Reverend Cain, a religious zealot responsible for the deaths of his many followers. His goal is simple. He wants the angelic Caroline, but the love of her family and the power of a powerful psychic once again unite, along with an elderly Native American, to fight back. For her life. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't include the cool song. God is in his holy temple. <laughs> Which I must admit has so many different renditions in how it's played out. I kind of fucking love it now. Ah, <laughs> oh, brilliant. So, as is tradition on this show, gentlemen, what do you think Poltergeist 2 has a rating of on RottenTomatoes.com? Uh... Percentages and ratings out of 10, please. What? Alec, let's go with you first. I'm going to go with uh, 80%. And Poltergeist like... 2. Oh, Poltergeist 2. Oh, what was, what was Poltergeist? <laughs> I was going to say. We will yeah. compare with Poltergeist in a moment. But right, okay. Listen. Poltergeist 2, I'm going to go with like, I know, 32%. Okay, okay. Stuart? Oh, I'm going lower than that. I'm going 18. Tim? No, I think, I think, I think it would... I think critics don't tend to understand horror. So I think <laughs> it probably did better than we think it did. So I'm going to say... I think I think yeah, about like thirty five. Yeah, fuck that twenty one. <laughs> Tim, you are the closest. Oh, thirty seven percent. Always plus Tim with Ooh. an average rating of four point seven out of ten. Mm. Mm. That sounds about yeah, right. Yeah, it, it deserves less than that. <laughs> yeah, it does. It, really it does. does. It is garbage. And how about the percentage rating for the first film? Any guesses there? I'm going to go for the year it was released. Eighty two. Interesting. I go go eighty. I'm going to say eighty seven. I'll say 84. Tim, once again, Damn 80, it, oh, 86%. Wow, whoa. On fire. Highly, highly rated with an average of 7.2 out of 10. Mm. So it is, in classic sequelizers fashion, about a 50% drop from the first one <laughs> to the second one. Jesus, yeah. It's a significant difference and appropriately a terrible sequel to a good movie. Yeah. It, it's a, it's, the second one is a weird thing. I, I just mentioned the kind of nomination for an Academy Award. In the same time, it was nominated for a Razzie as well. So yeah. it's one of those great classic <laughs> films that has an Academy Award nomination and a Razzie nomination but as well. To be fair, Suicide Squad won an Academy Award, so <gasps> don't, <laughs> this don't get me started. <laughs> Do not get me started. And, and uh, the, the Academy Award nominated Boss Baby also. Uh, oh, oh, God, yes, yeah. How is that allowed to... Yeah. Oh, God. Babe got six nominations while Seven got two. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> in 1996. So before we leap into Poltergeist 2 and how awful it is, can mm. we say what we did think was good about it? 
Uh, yes. God is in <laughs> <laughs> I think Matt has made his stance very clear. <laughs> I really like the reuse of the font in the credit <laughs> sequence from nice, the original nice. film. <laughs> I really like Kane. Oh, yes. Not I... as conceptually, but actually the way it's realised with the poor, I can't remember the actor's name, but the poor Julian chap. Julian something. Julian Beck, yeah. that's mm. it. Uh, poor chap had stomach cancer he at the did. time, he was... so he's very skeletal oh, and withered I think withered he died before the film's release. He did. Yes, it's very it, pretty. But the thing is, the poltergeist curse where everyone keeps dying yes. as they oh, act in these films. Yes. It carries on throughout the and entire yet series. Craig as well. T. Nelson lives forever. Mm. <laughs> has he ever really lived? In the sense that we understand. Yeah. Are there? Does that carry on to the remake? It because, does. Yes, there are a right. bunch of injuries on set and, mm. and unfortunate events surrounding the remake yeah, it as was well. Released. In 24, yes. 2014. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's what caused Sam Rockwell to be in uh, three billboards. Mm. <laughs> no, um, it's a good performance though it is a really good very physically good I believe the voice was from somebody else but that doesn't surprise me it meshes together very well yeah. that, that um, a fantastic scene actually where he first comes up to the house oh that's like, creepy yeah. I get around I love getting around yeah. and he's just so kind of creepy. Yeah, I yeah. thought I remember the first time watching that I was quite young I was like this is going to be a great film <laughs> and, then, and then the producers actually came around to my house and rubbed dog shit in my eyes <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what it felt like. God, they did used to do that, didn't they? Yeah. God, back in the day. Uh, you never get that these days. I think it's interesting because I, I, I do think that scene is is the the height of the film. Oh, absolutely. Him, him just being terrifying and, and kind of slowly getting closer and closer to the house. And, and, um, and I think it's interesting that that's just in the middle of the day. And yes. Poltergeist, yeah. the original, also it does a lot with where most films all the horror is happening in the darkness and with yeah. poltergeist a lot of it is to do with light you know it's the light of the tv mm. it's the electrical disturbances it's the light of the you know ghostly realm yeah um so yeah i thought it was i, I don't think if you shot that now and i'd imagine that probably if we look at the if we looked at the poltergeist remake a whole uh, lot of it would be in darkness and i would be playing with jump scares and stuff yeah. I would throw Correct. in paranormal activity into it, which is all at night time mostly mm. while people are sleeping. It's it's again because it's, it's the contemporary equivalent of arguably. Mm. Um, yeah, I think you're right. And the bit, the whole their back thing yeah. works quite well. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really a fan of that, but I know what you mean. I though. think it works much better in the trailer actually. I think uh, yeah, I think they have a point there. Yes, yeah, the it, it line. feels a bit. Yeah. yeah, it is a bit cheap to have their here and then their back. As the two taglines of the two movies, like, <laughs> yeah, sure, okay, from fine. a marketing point of view, imagine if like, <laughs> Terminator One was "I'm here," and then, <laughs> and then the I'll, one, be, I'll here. be here. Oh, yeah, I I'll am be, here. I am. Yeah, exactly. I was once here. I'm trying to think of other things I actually liked about the film. If I'm honest, um, um, that's probably it. Yep. I think for me, that really is it. Um, that font, though, <laughs> oh, that's some class work. I'm sure this, and there's one the thing. The soundtrack's okay. I was going to say, the, the, yeah. the score is actually quite decent. Mm. I was going to say, again, all I'm going to say is, God is in this God is in this And something like that. I can't remember the rest of it, but it's pretty fucking boss. So, yeah, Poltergeist 2, the rest of it. It's not so good, is it? No, it's really definitely, not definitely so good. Not. So, like in the first film, they thought, cool ideas, we can have for set pieces. This one, let's have some shit ideas for set pieces. How about a kid's braces in oh, his teeth oh, and come God. to life oh. and fill up a room? So ropey. Like, that's literally a thing that happens. Yep. I think that starts off reasonably well, and then as the gag goes on, that's you're just so like, good. oh, my God. Uh, uh, <laughs> nah. Nah. Doesn't it end it by electrocuting it or something? It, it, something it really tries stupid. to. It tries to. Uh, yeah. To to jump back to a previously sequelized film from when I wasn't here, it reminds me a lot of when the computer gets hold of what's oh, name oh, in oh Superman. Oh my god! Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. yes. Which terrified me as a child, but now mm. I look at and go, "This still terrifies me." <laughs> <laughs> but no, the braces thing is just. I mean, having god, had braces just... that would come loose and just pierce my fucking. <clears throat> cheek i do sympathize but mm. the representation is so cheap and shitty looking that it just doesn't it doesn't look scary it looks dumb and then seeing craig t nelson struggling being bound by which then no longer looks like brace metal yeah anymore. It's, yeah it just it, i don't know it looks like it i can't even describe what it looks like it it, it almost feels like layered tin foil or something. Yeah, it's like, just oh, wire wonderful. wool yeah it's like oh know. no how will he get out of this and then mock that native american some more about that car <laughs> Because oh, that was a huge story that went nowhere. 
Oh god, the car subplot. There's multiple subplots in this movie that just go nowhere and have no connection to anything. It's almost like this separate writer just come in and like, right, we can't just have horror, we need car sales yeah. and weird cults and stuff and just Bomb historical monsters. figures that don't make any sense. It's just, yep, why not just undo all of the cool stuff that we set up in the first one? Another major thing I want to bring up, if it's okay, um, I don't remember the character's name, but suddenly they lose a daughter because the oldest daughter isn't there. I think she's supposed to go to university or college and it's not really talked about much, but the fact that it's not written in properly... Feels incredibly fucking weird. Well, isn't the reason they took that out? Because there was a scene that established why she wasn't there. Mm. And there wasn't the actress murdered? Yes. Or something like murdered by her boyfriend. Yep, killed by yeah. her boyfriend. Yeah. And they took it out because they were like, we don't really want to mention this because this literally just happened. Like, yeah, before but the, it still uh, it happened like six weeks before the film came out or something like that. So it was a real last minute decision, mm, yeah. I think, yeah. Which again is is very strange because of the fact that obviously, this is what I'm trying to get at. She wasn't even in the story other than a throwaway line of "Oh yeah, she's away doing like, in college or wherever it's going to be." But the fact that the story matters, just we'll just work around it by not mentioning it at all, not cutting away to it, not having any sort of connected tissue to it. It literally is a case of just I don't care about this character. There's nothing I can do. We're not really worried about a teenager. We're worried about children. To be fair, she is a weak link in the in the first film. She doesn't true, need to actually, be there. Yeah, As true. a character, she doesn't really serve any purpose, and they end up writing her out of most of the movie anyway. That's fair. She's just, she just off at friends' houses. Just, yeah, she does keep cropping up every now and again, Ron. The yeah. Else. yeah. Uh, well, I was just going to say that the the daughter kind of drifting in and out in the first one, I feel like they it's uh, a symptom of a problem that gets worse in the second one, and that you can see a lot in the braces gone wild scene which is where none of them act like they're in a house that's under supernatural mm. siege yes. they all seem very casual about like <laughs> all of it yeah. going yeah like, they're, they're either really intensely reacting to it but then they just go back to everyday life i was reading a review of it where there was a theory that they'd all just become like psychologically numb to this whole thing because <laughs> it's that... two years after set two years after the first one, I think. But even during the first just... one, it's like, oh my god! Anyway, breakfast. So tea yeah. time, gents. We can never go back into that kitchen again. Back to the kitchen. Except, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> except for waffles. Yeah, it's where the food is, and also that little slip and slide we've made with ghosts. <laughs> We're going. Oh fucking hell! Sorry. As I see it, Poltergeist Two commit what I consider are the three cardinal sins of a bad sequel. Ooh, yeah. There are three things that have popped up in a bunch of movies that we've covered. Not in all of them, but there's usually at least one of these in there. And this is one of the films that does all three. And the three things that it does that really piss me off is, number one, it retcons the original premise. Yeah. So... In the original Poltergeist, the big reveal is that comes about two-thirds of the way into the film is that the house that they're living on was built on a burial ground and that the the real estate company was supposed to rehome the bodies and they didn't. And that's why they're being haunted, is the implication. In these, At the beginning of the second film, they turn around and go, actually, turns out that under that yeah. burial ground was a cave where a bunch of religious cultists died. It's and so that's unnecessary. The I mean, and it's, yeah. It's like, so the entire, like, why? The, the theory... So that retconning something that, that was quite integral to the meaning of the first film really irritated me. And it seemed to ignore the whole message of the first film as well, which frustrated me um owning a house is dangerous just rent <laughs> is it as never marry you, craig t nelson is it, <laughs> if you rent on a burial ground is it as bad as buying a well house? to be fair they're there for quite some time before the ghosts start doing anything and then they start to move out and the ghosts say actually we should do something again it's like well they're moving Move it's a, it's actually an incredibly prescient film about the subprime mortgage crisis <laughs> <laughs> on my house <laughs> <laughs> on the subject of ghosts Stupid thing number two mm. is that Poltergeist 2 ignores Poltergeist rules about poltergeists <laughs> because Poltergeist establishes some quite clear rules about what a poltergeist and what a ghost is mm -hmm. and how long they do things for and what location they can be in and what their powers are. And Poltergeist 2, about 15 minutes in, just goes, nah, fuck it. We'll just do this. 
This seems fine. Braces. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> Brace never, yourselves. <laughs> never mind that stuff that was in the first film. Fuck it, we're going with this. Which yeah. really irritates me because what is it? What is the point? Why mm-hmm. is there an astral plane? Who knows? This is dumb. And thing number three, I really don't like this movie. <laughs> and I think this is becoming apparent. Is that your third point? That was point number <laughs> yeah, two. Yeah, it's really pissed like off, isn't it? I don't like, like it. it. Yeah. Don't I they go to the astral plane in the first film, though? Sort of. But not as astral plane as it is in the second film. No, th- they have an upgrade, they, haven't they? Yeah. They just fall out of the ceiling covered in goo, if I remember. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Point number three, they retcon a character so that that character d- hasn't learned any of the things they learned in the first movie. Isn't that is all the characters? But it's especially Craig T. Nelson's character because he in the first film he's not even a skeptic about these things massively they go it's poltergeist and he goes yeah that straight up seems to make sense I believe this for the first 45 minutes of the the second film, he's like, go away, crazy Native American man. I don't want anything to do with this. I don't believe in the poltergeist thing. We just got to go. It's like, why? Why? That's wrong. Fuck this movie. I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> You're on your own, Stuart. And yet it's still better than Highlander 2. Uh, yeah. Not a, yeah. Uh, not a, it's more cohesive as a film, mm. <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. The so and is and Hi- Highlander 2 is a perfect <laughs> example of just undoing all of the stuff you set up in the first one. Yeah, it's, Breaking it's an, all the rules. It's yeah, another exactly. great example of that. Oh, there needs to be a mashup of the two. Turns out the Reverend it Henry Kane was, was the beast I mean, and he was from the planet Zetox. Oh, <laughs> <that was good. laughs> God. Turns out he's also Egyptian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's that under the Native American burial ground underneath the cave is a Scottish Highlands Egyptian pyramid Spanish villa burial ground? <laughs> Jesus! They just keep going down. There's every set from every horror film beneath that house. Eventually, it's that huge storeroom from uh, Indiana Jones and the Ark of the Covenant sitting there. (laughs) Turns out that the other place is the quickening. (laughs) The other side. (laughs) Poltergeist 2, the other place. (laughs) Connery's had too much to drink. Poltergeist 2, the other place. Denver. Poltergeist 2 Denver is a movie I haven't watched the hell out I watch it I mean I feel like we haven't you know when we were talking about the things that are good about the film we haven't talked about the extremely nuanced and non-stereotypical use of a Native American mm. character in ah, there yes. who's the Native not American just, elder who's not just presented as a as a sort of wizened old figure to provide home, homey wisdom and uh, you know blowing uh, smoke in people's faces uh, and uh, supernatural powers yeah that, that was uh Oh, wait. And to be fair, to argue about proper car maintenance as well. Yes. <laughs> that's what we call death. That, yeah, oh, yeah. To, that's what made the character for me. car at the end of the film. Yeah. Oh, I don't... Don't worry about thanking me. I was doing my sacred duty, but I will take your car, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this wagon is mine. As the elders said in the time of the Jaguar, nick their car at the end. <laughs> <laughs> White man's wagon is mine. Mm, it's appropriate. <laughs> I was doing a Johnny Depp impression. Uh, <laughs> Touche. Uh-huh. That was You're my welcome. Tonto impression. Didn't hold up in court. It's not going to hold up here. <laughs> hey, that court. I didn't recognise it. <laughs> not caught my peers. So, for those of you who haven't seen the first film, I'll give you guys a quick little summary, like I do with the sequel as well. In Poltergeist One, the Freelings are a typical suburban American family. Husband Steve sells real estate in their ever-expanding subdivision. And Diane is a stay-at-home mum caring for their three kids, Dana, Robbie, and little Carol Ann. Strange things begin to happen in the house, however. Cupboard doors start opening on their own, furniture rearranges itself, and chairs go sliding across the kitchen floor. While whimsical at first, it soon becomes deadly serious when Carol Ann vanishes into a netherworld, where, oddly, she can only be communicated with through the white noise on their television. A team of paranormal investigators move into the house, but the forces that have kidnapped... Her are evil and powerful, requiring the services of Tangina, a woman who has dealt with this situation before. I must admit, I always found that a bit weird talking through the TV stuff. I mean, I get the idea behind it. I get uh, there is an interesting concept in the first film, which does not appear in the second at all, of motivation being that the evil spirits are trying to stop people passing over, and it's like oh, that's quite and using a child as you know a, a, a conduit blocker, as it were. It's like that's quite dark and horrifying and you know very much what happens when the ark of the covenant's opened and they're not closed again kind of thing like oh no the shit's getting out it's terrible but uh when it's just a a weird ass religious leader who's just off a load of people and you're all gonna die (laughs) good to know (laughs) 
we should, as I was briefly mention, the fact that Poltergeist Three is also a thing that oh, exists. A fucking terrible film. Worse than the second, do you think? I, I would actually think it's much worse than the second because wow. two is terrible. Three is uh, somehow worse because it's just very fucking dull. Mm. Uh, while I've this one... seen, I don't know if I've seen all of it. I've definitely seen parts of it, and I can remember none of it almost. That's the key key point because I mean, while this one tries to get a bit of levity, sorry, the second one goes a bit a bit of levity and a bit more visceral horror like more body horror kind of thing um three doesn't really know what it's doing and it's again complete diminishing returns sort of thing extremely forgettable very dull uh tangine is in it again though that's all right but she still doesn't do her job in each film every time she turns up and it's like oh oh brilliant i love this character she's so quirky and crazy it's be really interesting i love the way she plays it although to be fair in the first film let's get your daughter back that's quite quite a nice little bit a really cool little scene but then after she said, this house is clean, and it's not, she could fuck off. She's, <laughs> she's basically wrong as anything. Yeah. I, I can't be bringing her back three times. <laughs> to be fair, up until that point, she brought her A game. Oh, yeah. I think she's allowed like that one potentially very costly slip-up. <laughs> yes, that one disastrous idiocy at the end. Appearing in two sequels. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we should, we should make a Poltergeist 4 where it's just... Um, like a expose of false psychic Tangina. <laughs> Turns out she didn't have any abilities. She appears on the uh, on Bill Murray show on Ghostbusters. Yes. <laughs> Pol- Poltergeist four, you get the poltergeist. <laughs> oh <laughs> my god. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, should we get some team names then, gentlemen? Alec and Stuart, do you have a team name in mind, please, sirs? We do. We definitely didn't come up with it about an hour ago. Not at all. <laughs> Moments That's... before recording. And our team name is I Ain't Afraid of No Geist. Oh. One, one, for, one for the German <laughs> listeners. <laughs> that went down about as well as we thought it would. <laughs> well, I can't so much about it. <laughs> Ours is very British, to be fair. It is very British. Matt and Tim, mm. how about your team name, please, sirs? Uh, our team name this week is more ghosts, Vicar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's quite good. Thank you. Again, very British. Yeah. <laughs> Do we? Should we explain that for international audiences? Maybe there's a jo- for, if it, for Americans. There is a joke to which it's not really the punchline, but the the repeated phrase in it is "more tea, Vicar," as a vicar is offered tea. Yeah. So usually distract from a moment where something lewd is happening. Oh, more tea, Vicar. Or something like that. So uh, we've done that, but with ghosts. And also, there's a creepy reverend in it. It all ties in. It's very clever. It's an incredibly clever joke. It's so layered. That we've we've absolutely enhanced by explaining it. It's fair fair to say that both teams brought their A game to the team (laughs) name. Just like Tangina herself. Our Tangina games are present. You brought your A game, but you still failed. And brought your A game again, you still failed. (laughs) You just wait until the pitch is. Shit. (laughs) Speaking of which... Elevator pitch and cast and crew, please. I ain't afraid of no geist. Why, certainly. Our film will be called Poltergeist, The Assembly, and will be made in the space year 1986. Our director is Steven Spielberg. Our director is George A. Romero. Our director... What the fuck? ...is John Landis. Oh, my God. So, returning characters... Diane Freeling will again be portrayed by Jo Beth Williams, and everybody else can bugger off. Particularly the poor little girl who plays Carol Ann, for she did not live much longer, no, and she needs say. to have some fun and not spend so much time on film sets. She dies at 13, shortly mm. after Poltergeist 3, I think. Which is yes. just yeah. Awful. Unpleasant. Awful. Anyway, new characters. As in Poltergeist 3, Pat Gardner will be played by Nancy Allen. But I'm replacing the actor for her husband because he was too old. It Bruce Gardner will be played by Robert Hayes who, of course, you remember from Lovely Airplane, and also did many, uh, well, did did at least one anthology horror in the 80s. Their daughter, Camilla Gardner, will be played by Drew Barrymore, who at the time would have been 11 and was, frankly, already an old hand at horror films. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Vanessa Ames will be played by Angela Bassett in her first major role after... What did she do in FX? She was just like a news... Newscaster or something, wasn't yeah, she? I think so. I think, yeah. I'm not really doing very much. Is it? No. Uh, Monica Ames, her daughter, will be played by Tatiana Ali, who's seven years old. Um, at the time, had only done Sesame Street, but will, of course, go on to be in The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Uh, Brian Norse will be played by John Lithgow, brought in by John Landis, probably. 
And his son, Justin Norse, played by a six-year-old Macaulay Culkin, oh, who was doing okay. little bits of acting and bits and bobs back then. This would probably be his first major role. Yeah. Uh, the role of Dr. Chalice will be played by David Cronenberg. And Reverend Henry Kane will be played by Julian Beck, as in the second. The Shattered Man will be played by Doug Bradley. Oh. And Anita by a young Tilda Swinton. Jesus, this is a really interesting <laughs> cast. Score by Jerry Goldsmith, because oh, he was, he'd, he'd done good. Yeah, and I he love did so much of the 80s horror stuff as well. Yeah, genius. Mm-hmm. So, elevator pitch. After hours in a school in Southern California, four people recount their tales of supernatural kidnapping attempts suffered by their children. Oh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like, uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark, the TV series on Nickelodeon? I think it was. <gasps> He's on to us! They're all around to a campfire and saying, yeah, kids were fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> Put a little puff of uh, something into the fire to make it turn a little interesting colour. Yep. <laughs> little again. And uh, shine a torch the under their chin. Members of the chin. Midnight Society. Yes! That was it, yes. Interesting. Matt and Tim, also known as More Ghosts, Vicar. <laughs> Can I have your cast, crew, yep. and elevator pitch, please, sirs? So, our film is called Poltergeist Twilight, uh, and it is coming out. <laughs> team Jacob, Twilight. Team Jacob, God is in his home. <laughs> <laughs> and it is coming out in Year of Our Lord, nineteen ninety, eight mm. years after the original, and and the year I was born, and the year Jack was born. <laughs> no, God, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> the elevator pitch is: residents of a San Francisco apartment complex find themselves trapped as an array of Japanese ghosts are unleashed to torment them. Returning cast. None of them fucks. Bugger all. (laughs) The new cast we have, uh, playing the role of Bob Franklin, Brian Cranston. Very early on in his career then, he'd been doing like Amazon Women on the Moon and other really small little things. (laughs) He'd been doing Amazon (laughs) Women on the Moon, wow. (laughs) He's a cool guy, all right? (laughs) What a life he's led. (laughs) He hasn't even been in Power Rangers yet. Yeah. He did a lot of voice acting work. He did the the Street Fighter 2 animated film, the anime one, Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, Yeah, he was was nice. I never knew that. He was in Ghost in the Shell's anime, little tiny little roles and things. And then eventually goes on to become Brian fucking Cranston. In the role of Jeannie Franklin, his uh, wife, Gina Davis, who's been in The Fly and Beetlejuice at this point, goes on to be in Thermal and Louise. The role of John Ryerson, being played by Brian Dennehy. Brian yeah. fucking Dennehy. Yep, from First Blood Cocoon, goes on to presume Innocent and other That's things. our second FX cast member. Oh. Oh, what? Yeah, it is. A good point, actually. Yeah. I was really hoping you were going to say Brian Cranston and just have him <laughs> playing <laughs> everyone. Yep, we could do it. We find it's, a way. It's... <laughs> oh, Brian Cranston's Norbit. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> With designs by HR Giga. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. In the role of Ryerson's son, Hank Ryerson, we have Matthew Modine um, from Full Metal Jacket, goes in Memphis Bell, and then later appears in Cutthroat Island with Gina Davis, and no one ever talks about it again. In the role of his son, Pete Ryerson, a very young, fresh off Stand By Me, Will Wheaton. Wheaton. Will Wheaton. Um, also in Next Generation stuff, and goes and be Toy Soldiers and Flubber and other things. In the role of Lu Tang, we have um, James Hong, Big Trouble in Little China, the equaliser of all things. Tango and Cash. In the role of Jemima Tang, Lauren Bacall. In the shootest and misery around that time, went on for a star for two. The role of Steve Hubbock, coming off of Dracula and Masters of the Universe, Frank Langella. And it goes on to be 1492, Conquest of Paradise and Dave and just again, awesome Langellanus. In the role of Mrs. Rourke, we have Maureen O'Hara from McClintock and Big Jake and Only the Lonely and lots of old classic films. Dick Graves is played by David Carradine, mostly known from the Kung Fu TV series and goes on to Nowhere to Run and Bird and a Wire and then eventually Kill Bill. And finally, Carrie Hiroyuki Tagawa playing the role of Hasegawa. Um, he's the kind of actor you see his face and go, oh, that guy. And he's in The Last Emperor, Twins, Rising Sun, Mortal Kombat, and etc., etc. Our composer is Bill Conti, who is probably best known for The Karate Kid, did Masters of the Universe as well. So, you know, big friends with Frank, Frank Langella. And our director, or should I say directors... Yeah, this one's taking a weird turn. What? Yeah. Uh, rather, rather than anthology style, we're going for co-directing. Interesting. Ooh. And we have Steven Spielberg. Oh. And Akira Kurosawa. The second you guys said Steven Spielberg and, I went, what? 
I think we've both picked up on the fact that this is a Spielberg thing and always should have been a Spielberg thing and he should have helmed it properly, but have also had someone else involved to make it better, basically. <laughs> and I like that we've done the same thing. And also, I did, you, your film doesn't have the word two in it, does it? Well, number two. Oh. Neither does ours. Weird. That's because we want to distance it from the first, which is why we've got no bloody cast. So did we. (laughs) This is a bit strange. Mm. It sounds like it could be one of these episodes where neither of you stick to the original because the original is so bad. Because usually we get the somewhat traditional thing on Sequelizer now where one team fixes the bad sequel more closely and then one goes batshit insane off the rails. But it sounds like you both might be going off the rails, which might be interesting. You would think that, wouldn't you? I'm, I, I'm genuinely, really, almost impressed and fascinated, and kind yeah, of wait until you hear how shit it is. Though <laughs> <laughs> there was a ghost. Just it did like a poo. There is <laughs> He's done a little poo out of his chicken bum. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Malteser poo. <laughs> you had written there is a ghost. I then came in and went, can it shit? <laughs> well, yeah, but, but remember, PG thirteen will go for poo. Or see the. Tim wrote, this guy's eating chicken nuggets. I said, wait, wait, the chicken nuggets split and reform into a chicken. Problem solved. I was like, is that a ghost? Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Would it have been a ghost in Polar Ghost 2? Probably. Probably. <laughs> Braces were. <laughs> what is what is ghost? Watch this, John Oliver. <laughs> Kane is ghost. So if you want to hear the two teams' full pitches, you're going to have to tune in next week, ladies and gentlemen. So we will see you there when I Ain't Afraid of No Geist takes on more ghosts, Vicar. See you then, folks. Enjoy speculating, you dirty slags. And do, enjoy your speculums. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy oh, your speculums. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and enjoy your speculums. <laughs>